You're tuned in to More Living with Jim Brogan, broadcast live from the Brogan Financial Studios at News Talk 98.7, where old-fashioned values, expert knowledge, and genuine understanding come together to give you the retirement straight talk you deserve. Jim's a former National Advisor of the Year recipient and a financial educator, and he's here today to talk about how you can live out the best years of your life. Jim and the Brogan Financial Team have been helping retirees and pre-retirees across the Southeast for over 20 years in their pursuit of financial independence. You can reach them during the week at 865-862-6800. So sit back, relax, and get ready to learn, because more living with Jim Brogan starts now. Hello, welcome to More Living with Jim Brogan here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Hope you're having a very blessed weekend. You know, many retirement savers are wondering what their financial picture will look like as they approach and progress through retirement. In today's economic and market environment, the equation of how to reach the retirement you plan for has in some cases changed significantly. The question of how much you need to have saved has changed, especially with inflation. Meanwhile, Treasury yields and bonds have changed from a low-yield investment to a potentially viable option for higher-yield returns. All this adds up to make planning for retirement on your own a difficult task. So today's show, we're going to discuss these things and more. Well, number one, how much money do you need to retire? I can't tell you how often I get asked that question. We'll also talk about the Social Security program and should it change, how might it change? It is scheduled to become insolvent in 10 years. What does that mean? What what, what is the impact of what is likely to happen? How simple it is to achieve compound results over time on your money. And we'll also talk about executing the shift from a savings phase of life to a spending phase, which is the key thing that that changes when you retire as you move from a a savings and accumulation phase into a spending and income and withdrawal phase. And it puts a completely (coughs) different set of stresses on the nest egg. So how much money do you need to retire? The question for many people is the number one question you may have. And You know, there are a few key ways to kind of back into what that number may need to be, but in many cases, it's way more complex than simply hitting a savings goal, and it requires a more comprehensive approach. It is important to get a ballpark understanding of how much an individual needs to support your lifestyle without a paycheck. So let's just kind of discuss the framework, (coughs) excuse me, in understanding how to generate retirement income. So how much money do you need to have saved? And that's the question of the day. And, you know, that question has so many different variables and factors. Sometimes people say, Jim, you know, if I accumulate a million dollars, will I have enough to retire? And that's such an overly simplistic way to look at it. And there are so many other variables. So for example, what are your living expenses? And, you know, I mean, I know some people living on fifty, sixty thousand 60,000 a year in retirement, and they're in very good financial condition. I know others living on 110, 120,000 in retirement and not in as good a condition. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not just how much you make, it's how much you spend. We all know that. So how much do you need? Now, one rule of thumb some people use is that you need about 80% of your pre-retirement income in order to live. And I don't love that rule of thumb. First off, when you look at all of your income while you're working, uh, not all of it's going into your checking account. You know, you're, you're contributing money to a 401k probably. You have health insurance deductions. You have other things held out of your paycheck. Payroll tax. Payroll tax is something you won't have to worry about in retirement, uh, but it but it hits you 7.65% of your income up to right around $150,000, then it drops from there down to 1.45. dollars 
But there's just things withheld from your income now while you're working that won't be withheld necessarily when you're retired. Plus, you may be designating a certain amount of money to go into savings. What I like to look at is when you figure out how much money you need, you know, look at how much is actually deposited into your checking account per paycheck and convert that to a monthly number. So, you know, if you're getting 26 paychecks per year, multiply it by 26 and divide by 12, and you'll kind of get a rough idea of how much money is actually hitting your checking account every month. And then what's happening throughout the year? Is your checking account growing? Is it shrinking? Are there expenses in there that you won't have in retirement? Are you planning on paying off your mortgage? If you look at it this way, it's not terribly difficult to get your arms around how much you're currently spending. And then why would you want to decrease your lifestyle when you retire? I mean, a lot of people want to maybe increase their travel. But you may have some expenses like mortgages that go away, which would be a big a great goal for most people as they approach retirement. But that's a way you can get a rough idea of how much you're currently spending without having to jump through too many hoops and say, well, Jim, we don't, we, we don't know exactly what we're spending. And then you're going to look at where, what are your income sources in retirement that you know you can count on, and that's going to be for everybody, Social Security. Uh, you're going to need a Social Security plan. When do you start drawing? How do spousal benefits affect that decision? What about widow and widower benefits when one of you passes away in the future? Who's the higher earning spouse? A lot of things there. But you're going to get your Social Security. Maybe you get a pension. Maybe you don't. Maybe you have rental income. But put, it, put down the income you know you're going to be getting and compare that to the amount of money you're spending. And then you need to allow for income taxes. Now, that's a more complicated question, but income taxes uh, in retirement are not going to be as high as you think. At least they're not for most people that we work with. Uh, it's a real big surprise. And again, part of that is 7.65% payroll tax goes away uh, when you're no longer earning a paycheck. And then see what the gap is. Like, the, Jim, this is how much money I need to draw, including taxes. And then here's what I'm getting from these other sources. And then you're going to have a gap. How much is that gap? Let's say you need 80000 a year. And you're going to be getting 50000 a year from Social Security. So now you have a $30,000 gap. So now you're going to need to take your life savings and turn it into regular income. You don't live on deposits. You live on income in retirement. So you're going to need to generate income to support 30000 a year. Now, one rule of thumb many have always talked about is the 4% rule. Take your entire investment balances, multiply by 4%. So if you had $800,000 saved, multiply by 4%, that's $32,000 a year. And you could start with that level of income in retirement. Now then, over time, it's going to need to go up and it's going to need to increase because of inflation. You know, what if your Social Security doesn't keep up with inflation? Historically, it does not. Uh, what if your pension does not have a cost of living adjustment? That means it's going to put more burden on your income in retirement. How are you going to fund that income and take your life savings and generate income? Now, we're going to talk about that some in the next segment, or, or a little bit later, actually, in the third segment. But the bottom line is the 4% rule can be a place to start, but it's not a be-all, end-all. Uh, so it's just a place to start. Um, and I think if you don't generate income the right way, 4% starting out could be a little bit high, quite honestly, uh, especially in today's world and especially with anticipated inflation being higher. But the bottom line is it's, it's not terribly difficult to come up with a good plan with some good projections, and that's what you need. You need a plan. You need to know how much you're spending, and I just kind of walked through a good way to determine that without too much complication. 
you know, um, how much do you need to budget for taxes? That is a little bit more complicated, but most people in retirement, most of their income coming in is taxed at 10 and 12%. You may, you may have some taxed at 22, and you might even have some at 24, uh, but your effective rate probably is going to be less than 20% on all your income, meaning when you average all those brackets together. But coming up with a plan is important, and it's important to know where you need to get to. Um, you know, that commercial, what's your retirement number, uh, that's such a, you know, and, I, and I'm asked it all the time, how much do I need to save? But it's just so much more complicated than that. How much do you need? How much are you spending? What's your lifestyle? Are you going to reduce taxes with your plan? What is your other income? But coming up with a plan, and then, of course, as I mentioned earlier, Social Security election is going to be a big part of that. But coming up with a plan and having it on paper, knowing where you need to get to, is critically important. Now, when we come back, we're going to dive into Social Security. I've talked about income from Social Security. We're not going to, I'm not going to get into Social Security election today. What we are going to talk about is the fiscal nature of where, so the reality of where Social Security is and how it's likely to change. So stay with us, and, 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 and what does that mean for your retirement? So stay with us. This is More Living with Jim Brogan here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. Welcome back to More Living here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. I'm your host, Jim Brogan. The Social Security program and the structure of its fund have come into question due to its dwindling reserves given rising pressure from increased lifespans, decades of low interest rates and low returns on the Social Security fund, and downturns recently have forced people to enter retirement earlier than expected, and the Social Security fund must reckon with its future insolvency if not enough is done to save it. But what can you really expect from Social Security in the future? Now, I'm not an alarmist. And I don't think Social Security is going to go away, even for younger folks. So I'm not a gloom and doom guy. Uh, I know back in, believe it or not, the 70s, people were concerned about Social Security solvency and funding the Vietnam War. And that was one of the reasons we created laws to be able to do, save more tax preference for retirement and things like retirement accounts. And then that was expanded in the 80s. Um, so there's always been concern there. Uh, and, and it is an issue because in 10 years, 2033, Social Security is projected to run out from the trust fund. And so then what will happen is the money coming in from payroll deductions, you know, that's how it's funded, will be about 20% less than what is needed to fund current beneficiaries. So an easy way to think about that is we'd have to have almost a really over a 20% reduction in Social Security benefits. Now, I don't think that's going to happen. Lawmakers are talking about two key changes, raising the retirement age, you know, maybe to age 70, and then increasing taxes on payroll. And the way they would do that is right now, I mentioned in that last segment, you know, you're capped on Social Security tax withholding. And it's right around, I don't have the exact number right in front of me, but it's right around $150,000. So in other words, when you make more than that, the Social Security withholding goes away. And the Social Security withholding is 12.4%. It's you pay 62 and your employer pays 6.2. So that's a lot of money. That's not part of income tax. That is social security tax off of payroll. That's why if you're self-employed, you have that self-employment tax. 12.4 of that is, is social security. Well, they're talking about reapplying social security payroll tax when wages get up over some larger number. 
At one point they mentioned 400,000. Recently they've mentioned 250,000. So then that 12.4% tax would kick back in. That's a big tax. That's a lot of money for people making more than those amounts. So that's one thing that's been talked about. And then some have called for raising the full retirement age to 70 for people born 1978 or later. Now, previous, in previous years, there have been discussions about raising the Social Security age, the full retirement age, to 69. You know, right now, if you're born 1960 or later, it's 67. L raising it two years is effectively a 12% reduction in your benefit because it's saying if you still want to draw it at 67 instead of 69 as an example, because the full retirement age will be 69 now, if you draw at 67, it's about a 12% reduction in your benefit, just rough figure. So that would be a reduction in benefit. And I think that's likely for younger people. How much younger, that part we don't know. Uh, however, both Republicans and Dif Democrats want to attack the issue in different ways. And the consequences of stalemate could, could result in significant costs to the American people. Because once the depletion dates are reached, if there's inaction and nothing done, benefit cuts would have to be 20% or else more money would need to be coming in. So the Social Security decision is so fundamentally important. We've got, you know, the consequences of increasing the payroll tax to save Social Security you know, there's no, there's no guarantee it would solve the issue permanently. Some people say wealthy people can pay that. Um, you know, I will have to say that there's a cap on your Social Security income benefit, right? In other words, if, if you hit that cap on the withdrawal, on the withholding at 150000 there's also a cap on how much you can draw in retirement. So if you institute additional payroll tax for people when they get above 250 or 300,000 or whatever it would be, then wealth, you know, higher income individuals will basically be paying in an extra tax that they'll never ever receive a benefit for. So we can debate whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing. What is the economic impact of that? Uh, we can debate all of that. We can debate the impact of raising the full retirement age, and it does effectively reduce your benefit uh, from what it would be calculated now by anywhere from 12 to 18 percent. But if you're closer to retirement, I'm not too worried that you're going to have a substantial change in your Social Security benefit structure. Uh, if you're you know, 60 or older, even 55 or older, I think it's unlikely. I think one thing that could end up happening is, you know, right now, no matter how much income you make in retirement, at least 15%, one five, 15% of your Social Security income is tax-free money. And I think that could change where all of, none of it is tax-free and all of it is taxable if you make over certain income thresholds. But that's where I see potentially the biggest change, especially if you're already over age 60. I think younger folks, I don't think Social Security is going to be taken away. I just think the benefit will be reduced because you have to be an older age in order to get the full benefit. So if you draw it earlier, the benefit will be reduced. However, people are living longer and longer lives. You know, full retirement age when Social Security was passed in 1935 Full retirement age was 65. The average life expectancy in 1935 was less than 65 years old. So the average person was never going to get a benefit from Social Security. Well, it's almost 90 years later, and the Social Security age, full retirement age, has gone up two years. And people are living into their 90s. So, you know... It probably needs to go up. It was meant to pay for the for the last, you know, years of your life to help supplement income when you can't work anymore. So uh, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing for younger folks. Um, 
So I don't think it's gloom and doom. I think Social Security will be there for all of us. I think even young folks, they're just going to probably be some changes. My biggest concern is that they wait until the last minute. You know, um, the further they put it off and kick the can down the road, the bigger the issue it's going to be. And right now we've got the issue with the debt ceiling. And we've got trade-offs that, that Congress is going to have to consider in raising the debt ceiling. The Democrats want to re resist benefit cuts and increase income taxes. And the Republicans oppose higher taxes and want to compromise to reduce benefits. N not necessarily Social Security, but, but just government you know, spending. So there's a plethora of other items that must be funded with taxpayer dollars. It's not feasible to expect that taxing the rich would pay for everything. So we've, you know, we've got to get our economic house in order. And the longer we wait, the more the consequence could be. Uh, but I don't think Social Security is going to go away. Um, a bigger issue is Medicare, because Medicare funding is really a bigger issue than Social Security funding. Uh, but the bottom line is, You've got to be able to count on some of that Social Security income. Uh, Social Security w is really not intended to replace all of your income. It's intended to pay maybe 30 to 40 percent of your income need in retirement. Okay, so uh, then you have to use the rest of your life savings to plan for additional income. And I talked about how much do you need in the last segment. Bottom line, you need a good plan for that. It is likely that with inflation, and with Social Security changes, as we, especially the younger you are, the more you're going to have to rely on yourself and your own savings program in order to be effective in saving for retirement. Now, when we come back, we're going to talk about how simple investing achieves results with compounding and the fact that a more stable earnings rate often pays more than a more volatile rate that can sometimes be high and sometimes be low. So stay with us. This is More Living with Jim Brogan here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. This is More Living with Jim Brogan right here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. We're with you every th every Saturday from 9 to 10 a.m. and again 3 to 4 p.m. You can catch all of our podcasts online. Go to BroganFinancial.com and click on radio. We're In a minute, I'm going to get into keeping it simple with compounding returns and some of the math associated with investing and some of the cruel math associated with uh, cr with big losses. But before we do that, I do want to talk about the recent legislation that was passed a couple of months ago, the SECURE Act 2.0, that affects our retirement accounts. Um, I have just published a guide on the SECURE Act 2.0. You can get that guide complimentary at my website. You can download that if you go to brokenfinancial.com and click on Resources. You'll see it right there at the top. I do want to hit a couple of highlights. You know, the, the original SECURE Act was passed at the end of 2019, and it kind of changed some fundamental things about retirement accounts. It, it increased the, the age you have to start drawing money out with those required minimum distributions. It increased it to age 72. Uh, it also allowed uh, additional savings opportunities. Um, it changed how IRAs get passed from one generation to the or from one person to another there were a lot uh, there were a lot of pretty fundamental changes secure act 2.0 there aren't as many major changes there are some changes in an effort to make it easier for you to save for retirement why because people are going to have to be more and more self-reliant in the future because of things like potential changes in social security and things like that the only main thing, big thing, that almost none of this goes into effect in 2023. And the only major thing you need to be aware of is if you were born in 1951 to 1959, your required minimum distribution RMD age went to 73. 
So the most urgent thing is if you were born in 1951, you thought you were going to have to take an RMD this year, and now you don't. Uh, now, if you're born 1960 or later, they raised it up to, not, to 75. All right, they also changed some of the rules on how Roth 401ks are inherited. They added the ability to add more money to retirement accounts and, and, and do even larger catch-up contributions if you're in your 60s. Uh, they just basically gave a lot of expansion. And, and some of this goes into place in 2024, some in 2025, some in 2026. So they're kind of off in the future. Uh, they do are going to allow for more pension annuity type options inside retirement accounts with employers. I think the biggest thing to know, though, is, you know, there's not a whole lot that goes into effect right away other than the RMD age. I think the biggest thing is, you know, how do you stay on top of the rules as they're constantly changing? Because they do. And you have to stay informed of all these changes and how it could impact you and where are their opportunities. You know, having an extra year before you take RMDs from your IRAs and 401ks is a huge tax planning opportunity for people that born 1951 or later. So it's important to stay on top of all this. That's one thing we try to do with, for you here on this radio show and at More Living with Jim Brogan uh, is, is keep you up to date. Go to our website, download our complimentary guide on the Secure Act 2.0. Just go to BroganFinancial.com and click on Resources. Uh, also, you can click to sign up for our e-newsletter that goes out once a week, and it keeps you up to date of all the content we're producing, whether it's a Secure Act guide or whether it's blogs or a video uh, podcast on you know, some retirement concept, whatever it is. Uh, that's a great way to follow us and stay up to date with all of the content we are creating so that you can make informed and prudent decisions that can impact the quality of your life in retirement and really overall in your life. Now, seeking a high rate of return can surely pay off for you, especially when trying to beat inflation, but there are costly factors associated with risky investment strategies and some even more costly than you may think. Steady compounding returns have the potential to do much more for you in the long run when compared to a more volatile investment with a high average yearly return. That's right. Stable, more steady returns over time often have the ability to compound more interest in earnings than earning a higher average return but having a much higher variability in the return. Volatility is riskier than it's made out to be. And one of the main reasons is because of the cruel math of losses. So think about this. If you have $100,000 and you lose 50%, you now have 50,000. If you have 50,000 and then you make 50%, how much do you have? 75,000, right? 50% 50 of 50,000 is 25, so you'd go to 75,000. So you're in the hole by 25%. What is your average return? Zero. F plus 50, minus 50, average return is zero. But you're actually in the hole 25%. In reality, if you lose 50%, you have to make 100% on the 50,000 to get back to the 100,000, right? And then your average return says you've made is, is very high, but you actually are just break even. That's that's tr kind of a simplistic way of saying that. And granted, 50% is a big return. I mean, a big uh, loss. But you know, our average bear market is a 40% loss. If you lose 40% on an investment to get back to break even, you have to make 67%. So if you lose 40 and then make 40, you're still in the hole 16%, and your average return is zero. So when you think of the dollar value of your assets, these average returns don't measure up because downside risk is much more dangerous and compounded than it's made out to be. 
So steady positive gains often can return more money. Now, especially in a volatile choppy environment. You know, if we go back to 2009 and come forward to the end of 2021, we had a raging bull market. So you could be very aggressive and have highly varied returns. There weren't a, there weren't a lot of big negative years in there. Uh, but now we're in more of a maybe a decade where mar markets are going to be choppy, where maybe we have good years, but we also have bad years. And those average returns, when the swings are big, don't don't add up. And so compounding more stable returns may make a lot more sense uh, than you think. So I, I think, what, what does that mean? What do you need to be doing? I think what it means is, I'm not saying put all your money under the mattress. You need to beat inflation. On the one hand, CDs and treasuries and bonds are a lot more attractive today than they were even 16 months ago. But they're still not higher than inflation. Right. I mean, you can get we can get a CD at 5.3 percent for one year. Well, and that's still not keeping up with inflation. Inflation still between six and seven percent. Uh, so historically, those types of instruments do not beat inflation. Uh, however, they do provide stability. I think one of the biggest things is, you know, when you invest at risk in investments for growth, you know, the stock market over the long haul has been the single best way to beat inflation over time. The problem is the choppy variability of the returns. When, when it gets more volatile, like it's been recently, the average return doesn't add up, as I've illustrated. So what that means is, as you get closer to retirement and as you're in retirement and you don't have 20 or 30 years to wait out choppiness, it means you've got to have a plan in place to reduce volatility in your growth portfolio. How do you do that? Number one, you don't own, you don't just own nothing but stocks or stock funds. You don't own just nothing but real estate. You don't own nothing but gold and silver whatever it is, uh, because it, when you own a lot of one thing, then whatever that one thing does is what you're going to do. When you own a whole bunch of things, the idea with diversification <clears throat> is if you own a whole bunch of things, you have one thing zigs and other zags. So if one thing like stocks or stock funds are way down, hopefully they're not all way down. So the idea is if you instead of only owning two or three things like large cap stocks, international stocks, and U.S. bonds, maybe you own nine or ten things, and you have a lot more stuff like commodities and natural resources and energy and real estate and, and other things, and, and adjustable rate bonds that can go up with rising interest rates. So the idea is if you have nine or ten things, then no matter what happens in the economy, you're going to have something, maybe three or four things that are doing pretty well or holding their own. So when the market is sharply down, you don't lose as much. And you don't have such cruel math. Now then the flip side is, is when the market booms for three or four years, you're not going to make as much. Right? You're going to have a few things that are not doing as well. Now, some people are saying diversification did not work last year because all asset classes were down except for commodities. Well, but it did kind of work because a lot of those asset classes last year were down single digits. So, yeah, stocks were down 18.2%. Growth stocks were down more like 25 to 30%. Value stocks were down less than 10 uh, bonds were down 13%, but adjustable rate bonds might only been down 6 or 7%. Nat natural resources were closer to break even. So you have, you know, you have things in there that help absorb the blow. The, the biggest threat to retirees today, in my opinion, is losing too much money in a market downturn. We call that tail risk. It's that tail, those, that 1 in 20 or 1 in 40 
event that happens where the market just goes off a cliff like it did in 2007, 08, and 09. Uh, so we've got to have a mechanism to reduce the real excessive return uh, loss. And you do that by owning more stuff. Yes, that does mean you'll make, you'll make less when markets boom. And then one thing I think that's critical to own now as part of that diversification is you should own volatility, meaning you have hedges in your portfolio that when the market is more volatile, both up and down, most importantly, but also up, you actually have investment that pays off based on volatility. And there are great ways to do that. You don't just have to buy the volatility index, the VIX. There are other ways to do that uh, with options. There's your ways to generate income with selling options. There's ways to uh, protect yourself on the downside by buying options where it's almost like paying for insurance. Uh, there are just a lot of ways to structure a portfolio where you can make money when markets are more volatile. Uh, you don't need a lot in that, but having a little bit of that diversification will help. The bottom line is if you own a little bit of a lot of different things, you just shouldn't have the really, really bad tail risk that happens when the market loses 35, 40, 45 percent. Now when we come back, we're going to talk about executing the shift from saving and accumulating money to withdrawing and spending it in retirement. So stay with us. This is More Living with Jim Brogan here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. Welcome back to More Living here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI, where it's all about living the best years of your life your way. You know, shifting from building wealth to generating income in retirement is so critically important. It is a fundamental change. You know, from the time you started building your career, you've taken measures to save for your eventual retirement. You put away money in savings, contributed to investments, an IRA, a 401k. You watched your money grow as you contributed to it over time. When markets are choppy, you're continuing to contribute money, which is a huge benefit of the savings phase of life because when markets are sharply down, you're continuing to invest. So you're getting into markets when they're down. And just as critically, you're not making withdrawals from your investments when markets are down. But just because you save for retirement doesn't mean the financial strategy stays the same once you're ready to enter retirement. You know, I often say, the plan that gets you to retirement is not the plan that will get you through retirement. Now, building wealth is not just a concept for the ultra rich. Building wealth is a necessity for all Americans. You've done it by saving and investing throughout your working years. Protection does become more important when you get closer to retirement. One of the biggest risks, as I mentioned, is that tail risk in the last segment when we have the big loss. And you have to have a way, number one, to help hedge that risk with greater diversification. You also need an income plan. And one of the key components for an income plan to me is that you don't depend on risk investments for short-term income. You know, the stock market is unpredictable and it's volatile. And if you're depending on that in the short term, it's a crapshoot. Where will the market be in three months? I have no idea. Where will it be in a year? I can tell you, I can, I have an educated guess, but I could be right, I could be wrong. Now, where will it be in 10 years? I can have a little bit more, more assurance of a prediction when I'm looking out 10 years. You know, the range of possibilities in terms of average compounded return over the next 10 years starts to get a lot tighter. The range of possibilities in the next 12 months, I mean, gracious, we could be down 30% or up 20%. 
So we shouldn't be depending on more volatile, the more volatile the investment is, the more it should be structured out to the future. So you should be drawing income from things that are stable or protected. Now there are also some misconceptions to look out for when you look at retirement income. One misconception is that Social Security is intended to replace most of your income. It's not. It's supposed to cover about 30 to 40 percent of your income need. Another misconception is Social Security should be claimed as early as possible. You know your benefit increases at full retirement age to, to age 70, it increases 8% per year. If you're, l- listen to this, if, you're full, if your benefit at age 62 is 2000 a month, at 70, it's over 3500 a month. That is over a 75% increase in your benefit. That doesn't necessarily mean you should delay most people, if we look at the data and the numbers, most people file for Social Security too early. Uh, one misconception is that Medicare is free. It's not. Part A is free. That's hospitalization. Part B, Part D, which is drugs, and your supplement, those aren't free. You know, typically around 65 years old, you're going to spend five to 6000 a year on medical. Now, that includes your premium and your utilization. But you got to build that into your income plan. And then one misconception is that dividends and bond yields are the best way to get supplemental income in retirement. You know, the problem with that is if, if you're depending on stock dividends and bond yields, then you have to have all of your money. To be able to generate a 3 or 4% income, you've got to have all of your money in stock dividends and, and bonds. And that's going to increase your risk because you're not as diversified. Now, using dividend income from bonds and stocks can be absolutely be a part of an income strategy. But you don't want it, usually you don't want that to be your whole strategy because then you've either got everything in stocks to generate the dividend yield and you've got a lot of volatility, or you've got all your money in bonds and you're just not going to make enough to beat inflation. So dividends and bond yields can, can help but they're not meant to be a panacea where that's the only thing you do because it creates other types of risks. So structuring retirement income has to be planned for. We, we don't retire on assets, we retire on income. And having a plan to replace enough of your income in retirement, we talked earlier in today's show uh, about helping you figure out how much you're spending and how much you'll need in retirement, and then looking at what you know you'll get, things like Social Security, and then other income sources, real estate, uh, pension, and then how much are you going to need and what's that gap. Then you've got to know how to take your life savings and turn it into stable income that doesn't depend on the stock market in the short term and grows enough to beat inflation in the long term. So thank you for tuning in this week. We've discussed your wealth because greater wealth provides for more living so you can live the best years of your life your way. Thank you to Chris for engineering the show. Thank you to Jill for helping produce the show. And I hope you have a very, very blessed weekend as we get deeper into the spring. You've been listening to More Living with Jim Brogan, only on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. You can check us out online, broganfinancial.com. Have a very blessed week. The views expressed by Jim Brogan and his guests are not that of Cumulus Media. Any discussion of financial, legal, and tax planning strategies is not intended to be individualized advice and is general in nature. Always consult with your advisor for advice specific to your needs. This program's content does not represent a recommendation of any particular security, strategy, or investment by Jim Brogan or Brogan Financial Incorporated.